Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever time zone is relevant for you. Hello, so good to see everybody here. Thanks for joining us. Um, let me give a shout out right now to the person without whom none of this book club, anything could happen, and that is Trish. <laughs> Boom, whatever. I'm I'm giving you all the 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 shoots of joy. Pew, 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 21 yeah. guns a loop. Pow, pow, Something pow, like that. Pow. Well, hi Ben. How are you today? I am I'm happy to be alive. Like <laughs> like every day. Hey, you know what? Alive is a good thing. Um, I'm thinking. And why not celebrate life by thinking about all of the bountiful, glorious artwork and creativity mm. that life can offer, especially given the right conditions, meaning the funding behind it, the mm -hmm. support, that kind of thing. I'm, I mean, I'm thinking today's a good day to, to celebrate that, don't you? Do you have anything that might tie into that kind of idea? Mm. How could I make a connection here? Why, <laughs> yes. How, if that was not a smooth segue, my friends, I don't know what was. Yeah. So, Thank you, Trish, for that segue. Thanks for driving. And thanks to everybody for being here for this short-ish talk on Habsburg treasures. So I thought as part of our book club events that I should talk about some of the ridiculous gugas, baubles, just incredible thingies that the Habsburgs collected over their centuries as rich uh, Europe's like most powerful, oftentimes richest family. Believe me, there is an incredible amount of stuff. And I, I think that's probably one reason why a lot of people get into still today, kind of royalty watching or, you know, historically looking at some of these dynasties is because these people lived well, right? By contemporary uh, standards and even by today's standards, they lived pretty darn well. And many of them were absolutely amazing patrons of art. Uh, and whether it's paintings, whether it's architecture, whether it's some other interesting things that I'll show you, the Habsburgs in particular amassed some things that can only be truly classified as treasures. So I've selected 10 things, which I mean, it's hard to pick, right? But 10 things that I think are particularly interesting. Some of them, are no-brainers. Some of them are a little weird, um, and some of them might surprise you, but I hope it will be a fun kind of walk through some pretty eye-popping, and in two cases, ear-popping, what does he mean? You'll find out, um, things that we can all enjoy from the Habsburgs' incredible legacy of art. So I am going to navigate over to share screen. Point. Thanks again for joining us with us here. So let me see. presentation. Brilliant. Habsburg treasures. Here we go. Um, so, like I said, I'll run through 10 things. I'll talk about them. I'll tell you some of the stories behind them, including some of the Habsburgs who have to who like are responsible for them or are depicted in them. And I hope it will maybe bring to life some of the things that are in my book, but also just interest titillate and stimulate you in thinking about this ridiculous and interesting family. So to begin with the first Habsburg treasure, this you have to class as a no-brainer because it is full stop one of the greatest works of art in Western culture. What is it? I'm talking about Velázquez is painting Las Meninas right here. That's my favorite, totally. You, yeah, I mean, it, there's so much that I could say about this painting. I mean, literally, books have been written about this painting. So, you know, it's it's kind of inexhaustible. Um, I'll just tell a couple stories. And I bet anybody who's listening or watching knows the most basic story, like what's going on in this painting. But even that is a, it's an amazing kind of tale and the way that Velázquez is playing with us just on that very first level of what is the painting about? Because you look at it and you think, well, 
what's this painting about? And clearly there's this girl, little girl right there in the, in the foreground in the center of the painting who's looking right at us. And it must be about her. Who is she? She's the Infanta. She's the princess, the, the uh, daughter of the king and queen of Spain. Except, wait, the title of the painting is Las Meninas, which means the ladies in waiting. Who are the two ladies on either side of that cute little girl? So is the painting actually about them? Well, but actually think about it again, because look over there to the left, the left side of the painting, what's going on there? Well, who's that but Velázquez himself, right? And he is looking in the same place that the Infanta is looking. They're looking at us. They're looking at whoever is standing where we are kind of standing or viewing from the painting. But who could that be? Why is Velázquez looking at us and he is apparently painting a painting? Why is the Infanta looking at us? Why is some of the people elsewhere in the, in the background and foreground, why are they all looking at us? Well, because that's what's really happening here in the painting. And you've probably heard this story, right? Let's zoom in a bit. Here we actually have some of the key figures mentioned because you see in the background of the painting, the mirror. And the mirror depicts who is actually, in a way, the subject of the painting or the subject of the painting that Velázquez is painting, which in some ways is this painting, Las Meninas, but in some ways it's not. That's how he's playing with reality and perception here. Because in the mirror, we see Felipe IV, the King of Spain, and his queen, Mariana. And that's their daughter, Margarita Teresa, in the foreground. Just some stories about these people there. It's Habsburg, you know, intertwining here because Margarita Teresa, the Infanta there, she went on to marry Leopold I, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the Habsburg who ruled the Austrian Habsburg domains. Leopold I also happened to be Margarita Teresa's uncle on her mother's side and her cousin on her father's side. So she went off from Spain to Austria and married her uncle and died at age 21. And then in the back, those two Habsburgs, because yeah, Felipe and his wife were both Habsburgs. Felipe IV, I think he's actually one of the most interesting Habsburgs. He was such a cultured man, highly intelligent, incredible taste. He tried to be a good ruler, but he failed uh, in so many things. Uh, Spain reached its greatest um, breadth of its empire under him, but then everything kind of fell apart. His wife, Mariana, Felipe, when he married her, so she was from the Austrian Habsburgs, um, and he was her uncle. When he married her, he was 44, and she was 14. Yeah, kind of icky. Um, but one of the things, one of the testaments, I think, to how interesting Felipe was as a person was he was actually really good friends with Velázquez. And I love the story that Felipe would come and just watch Velázquez paint. And when Velázquez died, Felipe was really hurt by it. They actually had a friendship, which was kind of unheard of for a king, a man of Felipe's status, and Velázquez, an artist, for them to actually have this kind of friendship, which is not something that happened. Speaking of Habsburg treasures, though, of course, this painting is one of the Habsburg treasures, but Velázquez is responsible for more than one Habsburg treasure. Not only this painting and not only the many other paintings he painted, but Felipe actually put him in charge of managing and assembling his art collection, which again tells you about Felipe's good taste. And so fascinatingly, a good chunk of what is today in the Museo del Prado, the museum in, in Madrid, was actually acquired by Velázquez himself. So Velázquez himself is responsible for a collection of Habsburg treasures and not just this one. Next up, let's go to some architecture. In fact, Trish will recognize this because she is standing right in front of it, so to speak. This is her background. This is the Belvedere Palace in Vienna. And to me, this is the most beautiful palace in Vienna, which is a city, if you've been there, you know is full of palaces. But I love this one most of all. I mean, just look at it. The symmetry of the forms here and the, the massing of the different sections 
of this palace. It's so incredibly harmonious. I love that central kind of section. Uh, there's kind of the, you see here, the three kind of main windows on the ramp. And then either side of that, you have these two kind of big rectangles. Then either side of those, you have two of the smaller rectangles. And at the very end, you have these, I believe they're octagonal towers crowned with domes. And this whole facade, to me, creates such uh, a feeling of elegance and stature and grace, very different from other Baroque palaces. I mean, if you look at even Schönbrunn, the Habsburg's great summer palace in, in Vienna, it's sort of more monolithic and I think less varied and ultimately less grateful than this Belvedere Palace, which as you can see was designed by Johann Lukas von Hildebrandt and completed around 1723. Funny thing is that this was actually not originally built for the Habsburgs. Rather, it was built for Eugene of Savoy. And who is he? He was probably the greatest general the Austrian Habsburgs ever had. Um, he was actually originally from the French aristocracy and kind of a, a minor line, the French royal line. And he was this short, ugly dude who was the youngest son. So he was destined for a career in the church as the younger sons typically were, but he didn't want that. So he said, I want to be a military man. It would have been natural for him to join the armies of Louis XIV, the French king at that time, but Louis didn't want him. So Eugene shopped his services around and the Habsburgs said, okay, we'll take you. And I would compare this to in like professional sports, when say in NFL, American football, let's say you um, draft somebody in the sixth or seventh round who then turns out to be a franchise player and goes on to the Hall of Fame. Because the Habsburgs got Eugene like in the sixth or seventh round, this dude that kind of nobody else wanted, and he ended up being this brilliant, brilliant general. In fact, Napoleon later on said that he thought Eugene was one of the seven greatest generals in history. So the Habsburgs, in, in gratitude for the many victories that Eugene won, they said, here you go, dude, here's your palace, uh, or let, here's your kind of property, go ahead and build your palace here, just on the outskirts of the old town of Vienna. So it was originally for a Habsburg general, it was only later that the Habsburgs acquired it. In fact, in 1744, Empress Maria Theresia bought it. Um, much later, uh, another Habsburg, I bet you will know, because I've certainly talked about him in our previous session, is Franz Ferdinand. So Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was assassinated in Sarajevo in 1914 to spark World War I, this became his palace in Vienna. Interesting thing, though, that even during his time, part of the palace was an art gallery. And if you've been to Vienna, you know this is still an art gallery. I mean, the interior, there's the, the one of the other fa facades, the garden facade, which I think is also a work of art, but the interior is itself a work of art. This is one of the ceiling paintings, um, but it's not only the building itself and its interiors are works of art, but it's filled with works of art because it is still an art gallery. And if, if you've been to Vienna, I hope you went there. If you have not been to Vienna, you must go when you're in Vienna to this museum, to the Belvedere Palace, not only to appreciate the palace itself and this kind of Habsburg treasure, but for some of the things that are in the art collection there, such as most famously Gustav Klimt's painting, The Kiss, that incredible uh, Dionysian orgiastic, amazing painting is here at the Belvedere. So I hope you will go see that sometime. So that's the Belvedere. The next treasure I have for you, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing less than a unicorn's horn. Believe it or not. No, don't believe it. It's not actually a unicorn's horn. But it was believed at the time in the later 1500s to be a unicorn's horn. It's known as das Eichhorn. That's Einschirm in, uh, in German, which is kind of a corruption of the same word for unicorn. And they thought that someone managed to cut this off a unicorn. It was considered in its day to be more valuable than gold because it was thought to have magical healing powers. This was truly something out of fables. So you can understand why this would be considered to be a treasure. Now, Unfortunately, it's not a unicorn's horn. It's actually the horn of a narwhal. So those kind of like 
whale-like things, which I think mostly hang out in Arctic or Antarctic waters. So they have these big long horns like this. And uh, someone must have harvested that, uh, taken that off a, of a narwhal and began uh, touting this as a, as a unicorn's horn. And the Habsburgs bought it, thought, well, this is magic. We've got to have it for our treasure chest. And you can see this Einschhorn in the Habsburgs' treasury today, also in Vienna, the Schatzkammer, as it's known. Um, it's filled with things like this, just curiosities, relics, artworks, um, so much incredible stuff. I mean, the cradle of Napoleon's son, whose mother was actually Habsburg, these incredible robes of the Holy Roman emperors, stuff which is even more, I don't know what, magical and mythical than a unicorn's horn because supposedly the Habsburg's treasury in Vienna has not only the holy lance, so according to legend, the lance that pierced Christ's side, the crucifixion, but also supposedly the holy grail. So if you go to Vienna, go visit the, the treasury, and you can see not only what was considered to be a unicorn's horn, but what was thought to have been at one time, the holy grail. My next treasure is also maybe a little bit of a surprise because it's musical. So I'm a classical music fan. And it is hard for me to imagine a greater treasure than an opera composed by Mozart just for you. But that's what this is. This is Mozart's opera, La Clemenza di Tito, which is composed for the coronation of the Habsburg Emperor Leopold II as the King of Bohemia in Prague in 1791. And this is the title page of that opera. According to legend, Mozart wrote this in just 18 days, but that's Mozart's genius for you. Um, the Habsburg connection actually goes just beyond the occasion for which it was written. This is some of the symbolism behind why this topic for a coronation opera for the Habsburgs, because clemenza, which means clemency in English, was considered to be one of the Habsburgs' defining virtue, virtues as rulers. There's this notion in Latin of clemencia austriaca, which, is mean, which means like Austrian clemency, because it's true, actually, that the Habsburgs were relatively, call it clement or fair. They weren't as bloodthirsty and brutal as some European dynasties. So if you think of the Borgias famously and some of the terrible stuff they did or the Romanovs in Russia, you know, the Habsburgs were not routinely killing each other uh, or, you know, committing these atrocities in quite the same way that some of the other ruling houses of Europe did. So this idea that the Habsburgs were, were more clement uh, is sort of true. And so that's part of the symbolism behind this opera that Mozart wrote for them. I love the fact that you can still see a performance of this opera in the very theater where it first premiered. And that's the Estates Theater in Prague, which is still standing. So Mozart uh, wrote it for this theater, was there on its premiere, not only that, but also Don Giovanni, his opera Don Giovanni was premiered there, Mozart conducting. So um, this is something that, again, if you've ever been to Prague, I hope maybe you've been to something in this theater. It's this total incredible jewel box of a theater. And I love to see stuff there uh, and sit in the audience listening maybe to Don Giovanni and imagining that Mozart's spirit is still walking those, those halls somewhere as he almost could be. So I wanted to play just a little tiny bit of this opera. So I'm not, it's like two hours long. Don't worry, I'm not going to play two hours of opera. But I will pop over here to YouTube so I can uh, have us listen to this Habsburg treasure. You... And just make sure that um, also when you do the your share screen that you've enabled the audio on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can you hear me? Sounds okay, I hope. Um, Trish will let me know if you can't hear this. I'll just play, as I said, a little tiny bit of kind of the overture to Mozart's La Clemente. Is that working? I can't hear it. You can't hear it. Okay. Anything? No? No. I'm going to have you back out of share screen. Um, okay. Go ahead and do, do like do stop share or whatever it is. Yeah. And then go ahead and click share screen again. And then mm -hmm. the bottom left, you've got that option. Sure sound. There you go. Yep. And optimize for video. Yeah, optimize for video. Clip. Brilliant. You are so on top of it. Uh, 
Um, where would we be without without Trish in a far worse situation? Okay, let me just go back very slightly. Okay, brilliant. Yes, working. Okay. So as I promised, just a little tiny bit. Okay, I promised I wouldn't share the. I just wanted you to have a little you know, get that Mozart spring kind of you can hear and even the beaver of the overture. Uh, and um, so you kind of share sound. I hope that maybe uh, gives you the impetus to go listen to the whole thing, even if you're not an um put it on in the background while you're doing whatever else you're doing um but it's hard to imagine a greater musical treasure than having an opera by mozart written just for you next treasures are what's known as plague columns these plague columns are a way that you know you're in habsburg central europe because Practically any city of any size is going to have a plague column. And as the name implies, they were typically erected to give thanks for surviving a plague or some other disaster. Um, Vienna has one of the most famous. This is the plague column on the Graben in Vienna, which, as you can see, is from 1694. This is kind of the granddaddy of all the plague columns. Um, Various artists, sculptors, designers all had a hand in it. So there's like no, there's not one name you can attach to this. But look at this thing. It is an absolute riot of Baroque aesthetics and imagery. In fact, it's not even a column per se. It's kind of this, this cloud mounting to the heavens. Uh, and you can see these different forms all kind of swirling up there. What's going on in this thing? And this amazing piece of Baroque sculpture. So at the base, there is an image of Leopold I, whom, as I told you about already, he ended up marrying uh, the Infanta from the Las Meninas painting. And at the base, you see Leopold I praying for intercession from God. And that was after the Ottoman siege of 1683, which Eugene of Savoy helped battle. Um, so this is not only a plague column, this is a victory column to help celebrate Habsburg victories over the Ottomans. And then climbing up in that weird cloud form populated by figures, uh, the, uh, like the symbolism behind this is that cloud column thing is literally the angels as intercessors between humans and the Holy Trinity. And that's the Holy Trinity right at the top. I'll zoom in on that so you can see it. There's this kind of netting over it to keep the pigeon poop off it. But you can still see what's going on here. See that cloud of angels mounting all the way to the top. And there's that just gold bobble hanging up there, which is the Holy Trinity itself. Um, also on the base, you get to have the coat of arms of the various Habsburg realms. It's really a pretty eye-popping work, um, and it is considered by art historians one of the most important Baroque sculptural ensembles in all of Central Europe. This isn't the only one, as I said, though. I just want to show you one more Habsburg treasure of a plague column, and this one is in Olomouc. Olomouc is uh, in Moravia, which is today southeastern Czech Republic, um, and it's a city that's historically very important because it was the seat of a quite wealthy archbishopric, which is one reason why you have this incredible plague column there. So the date here, you can see 1754, this is late Baroque. This is one of the last great plague columns. And you can see that the aesthetics 
are already quite a bit different than that plague column in Vienna that I just showed you. So for example, you have an actual column here, and the column is a bit more classical in style. It's not this swirling cloud of Baroque extravagance. It's a bit more sedate because the artistic norms are changing. Um, it, this thing is huge. Like the, the one in Vienna is big. This thing is even bigger. And take a look at the base of this thing. There's a door in the base because this plague column, it's actually a chapel. You can go inside. And then you have mounting up towards the heavens all these different statues of people who have who represent very particular things. So for example, there's a bunch of saints, including because this is in the the former Bohemian kingdom, the Czech lands, you have a number of Czech saints, such as the guy who's known in English as good King Wenceslas. He's a Czech saint, actually, or St. John of Nepomuk, who's another one of these big Czech saints. So they're all depicted there. Um, but then you get to the top, and very clearly, in contrast to that one in Vienna, which is so extravagant that in some ways it's hard to actually interpret, this is very clearly the Holy Trinity. Because um, there's Jesus crucified, there's God the Father, and then in that big sunburst is the dove representing the Holy Spirit. So this plague column is, is over the top in its own way, but it's also an incredible treasure. This plague column in Olomouc is, to my knowledge, the only such that is itself listed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. So just this plague column in itself has a listing on UNESCO's uh, like greatest cultural monuments of humanity. The next Habsburg treasure is also something you might not have expected. It's not necessarily this neck collar, though that's part of it. What I'm talking about here is the Order of the Golden Fleece. That in itself is a treasure. What is it? This is a chivalric order. Um, the Order of the Golden Fleece might not ring any bells for English speakers, but some other things might, like if you've ever seen in the UK, the Order of the British Empire, like OBE, like famous actors sometimes get an OBE after their name. That descends from a chivalric order. The Order of the Garter in the UK, you might have heard of. Similarly, kind of a chivalric order. The French Legion of Honor is an order of merit, which also has its origins back in these chivalric orders. So this Golden Fleece was not the first such chivalric order, but it was considered certainly in its time, so in the 15th century on, probably as the most exalted, the most noble, the most impressive of all the chivalric orders. It was founded not by the Habsburgs, but by Philip the Good of Burgundy in 15, 1430. But then when the Habsburgs took over the Burgundian inheritance, they became the grand masters of the Order of the Golden Fleece, this most prestigious of chivalric orders. And guess what? The Habsburgs are still the grand masters of this order. Karl von Habsburg, the head of the house today, is one of the two grand masters because the other grand master is the King of Spain. So this is a treasure partly for its status, because if you were inducted into the Order of the Golden Fleece, you were among the most prominent, the highest status individuals in Europe. It's in some ways still today. It's now the Order of the Golden Fleece is populated by kings and queens, like Queen Elizabeth II of the UK is in fact in the Order of the Golden Fleece and other aristocrats, and occasionally some politicians. Um, so it's still around, it is still this incredible honor, and that in itself is a treasure. It's also a treasure, of course, for some of its regalia, like this neck collar. But I want you to notice the neck collar. You can see the actual golden fleece is that kind of the pendant thing there. It's supposed to be like a ram and it's fleece. But as a, to, to show you how important this was to people, take a look at this painting. You might recognize it because it's actually the cover of my book. Emperor Maximilian I and his family by Bernhard Striegel. And look at some of the men in the painting. Yep, they are wearing their collars of the golden fleece. And in fact, the tall one on the left is Maximilian I. Who is that also with the golden fleece that I've put a square around? That is Charles V, the future emperor of Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. Just to his left is his brother, Ferdinand I, who, was, who would also later become Holy Roman Emperor. Um, the other people in the painting, uh, the other man there with the black kind of 
hat beret thing. That was uh, Philip, Maximilian's son. And then to his right was Maria of Burgundy, the heiress to the Burgundian fortune who Maximilian married. And then down below her, that guy in the lower right is actually not a Habsburg. He was from the Jagiellonian dynasty. His name was Laos. Um, just one quick story about him. He uh, became king very young and didn't last long. He died at the Battle of Mohach in 1526 when the Ottomans, the Ottoman armies destroyed the Hungarian armies. And it's because he died in 1526 that guess what? Ferdinand there over on the left in that green kind of shawl that he became king of Hungary and Bohemia. So all these relationships you can kind of see in this picture, these people were never all in the, in the same room at the same time, but you get some of the um, literally dynastic relationships from the painting and you can kind of see how proud they were of their status in the order of the Golden Fleece because very typically the Habsburgs would insist that they be painted wearing the collar of the Order of the Golden Fleece. So that is a treasure that they themselves treasured in an incredible way. Another treasure I'd like to show you is another Belvedere. It's not just that I like my Belvedere's, but I particularly like this one. And it's an interesting comparison to the Vienna Belvedere because this is the Prague Belvedere. So Ferdinand, whom I just mentioned, the kid in green, whom I just showed you, who became the king of Bohemia and Hungary after Laos died at the Battle of Mohac, Ferdinand married Laos's sister. And he had this Belvedere built for her. Her name was Anna. And so this Belvedere is sometimes known as the Summer Palace of Queen Anna. You can see it was completed in 1560. I show this in part, not only because I like it, and it's another nice Belvedere, but this uh, palace is incredibly important in architectural history because it has been called as perhaps the finest piece of Italian Renaissance architecture outside of Italy. And if you look at it, it could actually be in Italy. Like, take a look at the row of columns. If you didn't know this was in Prague, you might think, oh, suddenly I'm in Mantua or Padova or Ferrara or something like this. It is pure Renaissance, Italian Renaissance architecture in Central Europe. And today it is a part of Prague's Castle Gardens. It's a really, really lovely setting. The palace itself, uh, Queen Anna never really used it very much because she also died before it was completed. But, and it went through a number of uses over the time. One little detail I love is that during the reign of Rudolf II, Emperor Rudolf II, whose capital was Prague, um, the great Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe used this palace as the site of some of his astronomical observations. Today, though, these gardens are just a lovely, lovely setting. I was there last summer for Shakespeare in the Park. And if you're ever in Prague in the summer, you can uh, go see theater, live theater, in these castle gardens with this incredible architecture as your backdrop. Though I'll warn you, the Shakespeare they do here is in Czech. So brush up on your Czech if you come for Shakespeare in the Park in the Prague Castle Gardens. Now this next treasure is one I've actually told you about before. If you joined us on our very first session, beginning of the month, this is the painting, The Feast of the Rosary by the great German Renaissance artist, Albrecht Dürer. And I mentioned this painting because of the ridiculous story of how it came to be in the possession of the Habsburgs. So it was actually painted by Dürer, as you can see there, completed in 1506, and it was painted in Venice. He painted it to live in Venice at the German church, San Bartolomeo in Venice. Um, but it ended up in Prague. And the story of how it ended up there is because Rudolf II, that Habsburg emperor, wanted it so much and valued it so much that he paid a bunch of bearers to carry it over the Alps and to carry it upright over the Alps all the way from Venice to Prague so that it would not be damaged so that he could add it to his own cabinet of treasures. Why did he want it so badly? Well. You can tell why from what's in the painting. So first of all, 
it's the virgin in the throne. You see Mary there on the throne with that crown is about to be placed upon her head by the angels. She's blue, very often the symbol of Mary in, in these Renaissance paintings. Down below to our left, to Mary's right, that guy in the ecclesiastical robes, that's the Pope. Some people say that it's depicting Pope Julius II, who was actually the Pope uh, who commissioned, say, for example, a lot of Raphael's works, but that's the Pope. And then across from him, who's this? Well, let's zoom in because that guy is a Habsburg. In fact, that's none other than Maximilian I, whom I just showed you in the previous painting, wearing the Order of the Golden Fleece. Maximilian I, who was Rudolf II's great, great grandfather, was a sometime patron of Albrecht Dürer. So Rudolf II wanted this painting, not only because it's a great masterpiece by Dürer, and he just, Rudolf hoovered up these masterpieces from all over Europe, but also because it's a masterpiece depicting his great, great grandfather. The story of what happened to a lot of Rudolf's masterpieces is kind of sad, or his treasures is kind of sad, because he did have the greatest collection of such treasures in Europe at the time. But then the Thirty Years' War happened, 1618 to 1648, and his collection was sacked. In particular, the Swedes sacked Prague right at the end of the Thirty Years' War, and they took a lot of stuff back to Stockholm. So this incredible profusion of things that he collected, arts, arts, magic, um, relics kind of was scattered all around Europe, but this thing survived and this particular painting stayed in Prague. I wanna just to have draw your attention very quickly to this crown. Yeah, I know you can't see it very well from this image, but this is the crown of the Holy Roman Emperor, appropriately at Maximilian's feet because, or knees in this case, because he was the Holy Roman Emperor. I'm just drawing your attention to it, but we're gonna come back to this later, okay? Because our next treasure is another piece of music, actually. And this is by the great Renaissance composer, Tomas Luis de Victoria, the greatest Spanish Renaissance composer, who's considered to be like one of the triumvirates of the great Renaissance composers, along with Orlando de Lasso and Palestrina. And Tomas Luis de Victoria was actually friends with Palestrina. Uh, de Victoria left behind a very large body of fantastic choral music, polyphonic choral music. I'll play you it just a tiny bit in a second. Um, and he was effectively the court composer to the Spanish Habsburgs of his time. So they had one of the greatest composers alive at the time uh, as their court composer. So Felipe II, the great uh, Habsburg king of Spain, funded some of Victoria's studies in Rome. And then we, when Victoria came back to Spain, he became the chaplain to the Dowager Empress, Empress Maria. And Maria was Felipe's sister. And she had married Maximilian II of the Austrian branch. So again, there's those tight, sometimes entirely too tight connections between the Spanish and Austrian Habsburgs. But Maria, excuse me, after, Maxim, after Maximilian II died, she came back to Spain and Tomas Luis de Victoria essentially worked for her. And one of his greatest works is called Officium Defunctorum, which is a service for the dead. He composed it very specifically in 1605 for the death of Maria, and it's dedicated to her daughter. So this next piece of music I'll play just a little bit of is a treasure because in itself is an artistic, artistic work that is considered by musicologists to be one of the greatest works by Tomás Luis de Victoria, but it's also a Habsburg treasure because he, they sponsored him and he wrote this piece of music for them. So let me navigate over and I will play again a little bit. Stop share and go to YouTube and share again here. All goes share. Okay, let's see. It didn't give me the option to select, but hopefully it does. Trish, you'll tell me if you can't hear this. No sound. Mm, okay, there's nothing playing just yet. Give it oh. a second. <laughs> now? Um, yes. Cool.
Okay, kind of hoping it's not that. Um, but I wanted to just give you a taste. I hope you felt that just washing over you. Just, it's miraculous. I, I mean, talk about a treasure. Those waves of blooming harmonies in this Renaissance choral music. I, I urge you to go back and listen to some more of Tomas Luis de Victoria, especially maybe if you're trying to relax because it just takes you into some other contemplative world and that kind of transcendental transformative treasure. There's nothing quite like that that I can offer you here tonight, but I just wanted you to hear that great treasure of the Habsburgs that particular piece that Tomas Luis de Victoria wrote for the death of Maria. All right, my friends, we're almost at the very end. So let's bring out some more big guns, the crown jewels. Yeah, this is another treasure of Rudolf II, actually, another one that survived. I don't know in a way how this survived because you'd think that someone would have stolen it or looted it or sacked it or melted it down at some point because this thing is near to priceless. Look at this crown. It's all gold. I mean, it's not solid gold, right? I don't know if you could have it on your head if it were solid gold, but everything that looks like it's gold, it's actual gold. It's not just painted, it's gold. And it's covered in diamonds, pearls, and other gems. The history behind it is that Rudolf II had it made for himself, as you can see in 1602, by probably the greatest goldsmith of that day. But it later became what's known as the Imperial Crown of Austria after the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved in 1806. So if you look at portraits of the later Habsburg rulers, you'll often see them wearing this particular crown. Now, I have this here as a treasure, not only because it's amazing to just gawk at, right, but also because of its symbolism. One of the things that I talk about in my book is how the idea of kingship evolved over the centuries of Habsburg rule. And this crown helps you understand that. So let's just look at the crown in some detail. There's three parts. The first is the circlet, which is kind of the base of the crown, that literally circle base. And then you see these, what look like flowers. Those are actually fleur-de-lis, right? The lilies, technically, coming out of that circular base of the crown. This first part of the crown is the traditional crown of kings with the fleur-de-lis. It has eight plates, i.e. eight like sort of sections and eight lilies. The eight itself is deeply symbolic. It symbolizes Christ, who the, the emperor was supposed to represent on earth. Because eight in this numerological symbolism is a doubled four. And four is the number of the material world, the created world. So like, think the four cardinal directions or the four seasons. And there's many other fours in this numerous number of symbol, sim, symbolism. And the four symbolizes perfection, which is associated with Christ. So you double it and you get eight. And a lot of this crown symbolism operates around the number eight. So that traditional crown of kings connecting him to Christ. And then you see these kind of wings kind of arching over the head of the crown. That ought to look a little bit familiar because it's a mitre. Who wears a mitre? Bishops. Well, why would a king have a mitre on his crown? Because of divine right. Because kings were considered semi-divine until the later 18th century when you get to rulers like Maria Theresia, when all of this stuff starts to be demystified. So the mitre, the fact that you have a mitre, a bishop's mitre built into the crown symbolizes how the king is appointed by God as his emissary on earth. He's not just the governmental power, he's the divine power. And then right down the center, you have what's called the high arch. And that is inspired by the highest crown of the West, the Holy Roman Emperor's crown, which the Habsburgs also held. It's studded with diamonds. You can see almost at the very top, there's a cross. But then at the very top, there's a blue-green emerald. And that emerald has a very particular uh, symbolism. Blue should make you think of the skies, which should make you think of heaven. So Rudolf helped design this crown and had this emerald put right there on the top 
heaven to symbolize the connection between the king and heaven. So this crown is a treasure, of course, for the incredible workmanship and the incredible jewels that bedeck it. But it also tells us a lot about this time when rulers were considered to rule by the will of God, when kingship was imbued with magic power, literally, when the king was an arbiter of justice and morality, and when the king was the sword arm of Christianity. And all of that stuff I talk about in the book, if you have a chance to read it. And when the, this crown was created in Rudolph's time in the early 1600s, all that still held, but then by the later 1800s, the supernatural elements of kingship have mostly disappeared. There's still the idea of the king as defending his peoples, and that has very long roots back into the early Middle Ages. But what happens, World War I breaks out, and then even the king, the Habsburg monarch, is no longer able to defend his peoples. And hence, one of the reasons the Habsburgs fell is because all this symbolic and practical power of kings became irrelevant by the turn of the 20th century. And you can understand that by understanding the symbolism of this crown. So this treasure actually tells you a lot about the history of the dynasty. And my last treasure for you connects to the theme of kind of going under or the fall because it's graves. We're looking at the interior of the Kaiserkruft, which in German means the, the emperor or the imperial crypt in Vienna. And in particular, we're looking at the grave of Maria Theresia. This is one of the weirdest treasures you can think of with the Habsburgs, but kind of incredible. This imperial crypt, it actually goes back to 1633 when it was decided, okay, we're going to start burying ourselves here. Uh, today, it's the last resting place for 12 emperors, 19 empresses, and many other Habsburgs. One of the things that's so weird about it is it connects to the Habsburgs' burial practices. So it's only the Habsburgs' bodies who are buried here. Their hearts are buried in silver containers in the Augustan Church in Vienna. Their viscera i.e. their abdominal organs, are buried in the crypt at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, and their bodies are here. Now, why? Why that weird thing? Well, it's, it's, it certainly sounds strange to us. It wasn't as weird in its day, and there are some other families that do things like this. Partly, the Habsburgs spread their remains out to spread their holiness, right? Because they endowed or honored multiple different religious institutions by giving them, say, their heart versus their intestines. But there's a practical reason too, and that is that these uh, things were often removed, these internal organs were often removed to slow down the decomposition process after someone died. Because the practice was these Habsburg emperors would lay in state for several days so people could come by and pay their respects. And I'm no physician, but apparently if you leave your internal organs in there, they're going to start composing and you're going to start stinking pretty quickly. So it's not going to be so... Uh, so handy for the funeral uh, on day five for all your subjects to honor you if you're stinking it up. So the Habsburgs had this thing where they separate or spread themselves around. But the kind of treasure aspect of this place, I think, is the amazing grave art. I mean, just take a look at this thing right here. Um, Maria Theresia's tomb is a late Baroque or Rococo confection, I guess you could call it that was actually prepared during her lifetime. So she knew this is what was coming. And uh, two of her very favorite architects and artists put it together. Um, it's an incredible work of art, sculpture. Just look at this. You can see the two figures on the top of the tomb are Maria Theresa and her beloved husband, Franz Stefan, looking at each other for all eternity. These are some of the graves of her children. And again, look at the detail on these tombs. I mean, just... Every little inch is centimeter is covered with some decorative aspect, of course, symbolism too with the various crowns. And you can recognize some of these crowns. To me, this is just an amazing window into a long gone world to a, a family which is still with us, but you know, whose time has passed in so many ways. A family that once had the money to spend as well as the idea, like more than that, the ideology that it was only right and proper 
that they should be so glorified even in their tombs. And I hope just seeing this gives you some access, as with the crown, to some of the thinking behind this dynasty, as seeing some of the treasures they collected tells you a bit more about them and the times through which they lived and the incredible taste that they definitely showed uh, and the eternal um, masterpieces that they gathered around themselves. The very last thing, last aspect of these treasures I want to show you puts a very fine point on the weirdness and the amazingness of it all. Uh, I'm, I also kind of like creepy things, right? As you can probably guess, because I'm showing you this. The very last image I'll show you is the tomb, just a detail from the tomb of Maria Theresia's father, who was Carl VI. Here it is. Yes, it's a skull wearing the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. So I, sh I zoomed in on that little crown, or I boxed that little crown in the earlier painting, the, the Dura painting of Maximilian, and here is that crown on the head of a skull, the highest crown in the West, which belonged to the Habsburgs for longer than any other dynasty. Uh, and it was so important to them that, yeah, they even represented it on their graves. It was that kind of a treasure. Thank you so much for listening, for following along. Uh, it was super fun for me to get to walk you through these treasures. Here I am back now. Um, as you can see, so many weird things, so many fabulous things. I hope it inspires you if you've read the book or if you listen to me watch this tonight to maybe go check out some more things because there's so many more Habsburg treasures that you could investigate. So thanks again for your interest and thanks again also to Trish for keeping this show on the road. Ben, why do you just keep knocking it out of the park? Why are you so amazing like that? Is it like, why? is it divine intervention, right? Is it divine, right? That you're like, you shall be the exactly. educating professor who knows all of the knowledge and tells it to us in magnificent ways. I would love to have, if someone has like a blue green emerald to give me and just put on the top of my head right now, I'll totally take that symbolism. So, <laughs> you know, you can, you can email that to me and we'll call it good. <laughs> Well, I, that was amazing. And we have like 50 million comments that people mm. are, are reflecting that same sentiment that I just said about how impactful this was and how much this really is supplementing what they're already reading in your book, The Habsburgs, The History of a Dynasty. And it, just as a reminder to anybody who might be newly tuning into us, we have we have a lot of people who, are, who have been with us since the beginning of Guide Collective, but maybe if you're new to us, you don't know that we have this program called Guide Collective Book Club, and you can become a member. And if you go to our website, guide-collective.com, you can find our page about GCBC, Guide Collective Book Club, and there you'll learn how to become a member, which is basically you send me an email and say, hey, <laughs> I'd like to become a member. And we add you to the list and then there you go and you get all the, the updates and the information. Um, but each month we have a new book that is moderated by one of our guides. And in this case, by the actual author, right? So the guide and the author of the book. Um, and Ben has done a great job this entire month with providing us with really cool supplemental information. So if you also go onto that, that page on our website, you'll find recordings of the introduction. Um, we have articles that he wrote, and then we have, this will be on there later in case you, are, you know, need to watch it again. And then next Monday, which would be the last Monday of the month, is when we are going to have our Guide Collective group Zoom discussion. That is only available to a GCBC member, right? So that, that we will not stream on Facebook. It'll go up later, but probably like a week later. But if you want to be a part of the live discussion, ask Ben your questions, share your insights. You need to become a member. Um, and we also have a Google document where you can submit your own questions throughout the month. Maybe something strikes you and you're like, oh, wait, I need to know more about that. Please tell me then. Or, you know, actually, that was kind of confusing. And, and I'm, I, I'd like us to go over this or whatever it might be. Just your insights like, wow, that was so amazing. I never even knew. That's cool. Uh, so you can put that information in there. What that does for Ben is it gives him a framework with which to develop 
his agenda for us for that group discussion. So really, it's not only um, in allowing you to engage and share your information, but it helps Ben to help guide us along on that group discussion day. So I encourage you to participate in that. I'm going to ask Ben, could you please in the comments later at some point, could you put in the YouTube links for the Mozart piece and also for the Tomas de, de las Victoria? Sí. Or Tomas Luis de Victoria. Luis de Victoria. Yeah, Sh should I do that even right now or do it later? Sure, Wh whenever okay. you feel, whenever. Because um, I, I can uh, do that. especially for that um, Sanctus and Benedictus piece, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was something that happened. Uh, there was a particular chord that came in with the with the female voices. And honestly, it, it, you said like, I, you, I hope you felt that wave of whatever it was. And I did. There was a resonance that happened that my body just went whoop I, and it totally aligned. Mm -hmm. It was piercing, but also very grounding. And so I do want to listen to that. And I'm sure a lot of other people would want to as well. And totally. just a couple of more housekeeping things. We did have some questions that came through then. So I, I want to address those and give me just a moment, everybody, while I scroll back. So Melanie is asking, how many golden collars were actually made? I mean, do we know? Yeah, so I think the number of people who could belong to the order at any time was capped at 50. So there are at least 50 like floating around, but you could keep them uh, is my understanding once you died. So there's probably hundreds that have been created uh, and almost all of them are probably still held privately because these things just get passed down. Okay. And then um, again, scrolling. Mm. And Joyce is, she, she, she just makes a comment. I assume Habsburgs financed the art and music similar to the Medici. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were they were the patrons. And again, still scrolling. Ben, Kathy wants to know, is there a family tree that you can recommend? Yeah, it's it's there's one on uh, Wikipedia, which I think is is OK, because it's really hard because there's so many branches of this family. So let me just make a note of that and we can I can include that in a comment or something like that. Um, so that if you want to try to follow the family tree, you can do that. So I'll stay tuned and I'll, I will hunt that down and, uh, and send that out. That's a lot because I mean, over hundreds and hundreds of years. And again, like you mm -hmm. said, the different branches, the intermarrying, the, you know, mm -hmm. different conquests, and then you, and then not even just in Europe, right? So we're talking about what happens in the Americas and mm -hmm. I mean, just this global empire basically. So it's, a lot to, to take a yeah. look at but whatever you can hunt down that would be mm -hmm. amazing and you guys you know that if you put in more questions in this comment feed we'll go back and we'll take a look at those if we if we happen to have missed them um, if you're watching this in the replay and you have questions always feel free to submit those um, those statements in there because we love that we love your engagement and are so happy that you guys are enthusiastic about what we're doing Huge thanks to Ben. And I do want to just um, round, round out this housekeeping issue. So what we have coming up this week, um, on Thursday, we have a brand new GC roundtable. And that is going to be moderated, hosted by our intern, Juliet Romano Olson. And sh what she is doing, just to give you a little drop hint, is that she is going to do a multi-generational uh, roundtable and discussing travel. So we're gonna have all the way from kind of late bo boomer, early boomer, uh, millennials. No, wait, wait, skip one. I skipped, I skipped my own generation. Hello, what am I doing? So boom, <laughs> whatever. I, that's how it's so Gen X we are. It's like, whatever, I don't uh, care. Exactly. <laughs> so, boomers to Gen X to millennials to Gen Z. Um, and maybe, I don't know, like maybe a couple of them in between there or whatever. So she's going to be hosting that on Thursday. So tune in for that. That's at 11 o'clock Pacific time. This weekend on GC Presents, uh, Susan Brown, who's one of our Scottish guides, she is going to be doing a feature on St. Kilda. And so you can tune into that. You can sign up for that. If you, if you look on our website, um, go to the GC Presents page. Uh, it's $20 per device and you'll get a private Zoom link and, and you'll be able to learn about St. Kilda from Susan. And then again, as I mentioned, next Monday is going to be the GCBC group discussion on Zoom open only to members. 
So sign up if you haven't already. If you are a member, you know that by Sunday evening, that's when you will get the Zoom link. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And I'm not seeing any other last questions, but if there's anything that you want to remind people of, Ben, um, that I'm not thinking of. Uh, no, I'll just say thanks to everybody for your attention. Thanks to those who've got the book and read the book. I'm super excited next Monday to have a discussion. I can't wait to hear what you thought or questions or wherever you kind of want to take that. And please do put your questions in that Google Doc and I'll kind of have a chance to cogitate before the session. But I mean, as you can tell, I'm, I spent entirely too many years studying this family and pretty enthusiastic about the chance to talk about them. So I, I'm, you know, I can't wait for next Monday just to see what has grabbed you uh, in the stuff that I have presented uh, over this past month and that's in the book. So thank you so much for, uh, even if you scratch the surface with me, I'm super excited to get to, to go a little bit deeper with you next week. And if you want to learn more about Ben and what he does, because he is, to me, a true Renaissance man. I mean, he, he does it all and he's wicked smart and he's funny and he's talented and he helps like social matters and he helps governments and he, he's just all these things. So if you want to learn about that, you can go to www.benjamincurtis.me. It's not me, it's him, but hmm. Benjamin Curtis. Yeah, exactly me you know what i mean and then mm. in addition to that if you are so inclined because as you know guide collective is an all-volunteer program and while we do have events like gc presents where we can kind of try to earn our own income that way um this is all being done voluntarily by ben uh, you know because like he said he is Fanat almost fanatical about the house person wants to share that with people. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are so inclined and you would like to tip him, you could go to PayPal and you can search for him um, at Benjamin W. Curtis at yahoo.com. And if you want to leave him a tip, that would be a very, very kind thing to do. So there is that. And then the last question that came in, I think, is from Kathy. And she says, what is the book for May? OK, so if you've already gotten through mm. Ben's and you're ready to mm. go on to the next one, our next moderator is going to be Jorge Roman from Madrid. And he is going to be doing Paulo Coelho's book, The Pilgrimage. OK, so not Paulo's first book, which is The Alchemist. Fantastic, by the way but the pilgrimage. So if you're interested about the Camino de Santiago de Compostela and a very innovative take on it and, and looks into meditation and how to kind of center yourself and using that kind of as a, as a, as a guide to take you through the, the fabled journeys of the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. This is the book for you. It's great. It's a quick read um, because it is so interesting. So you can pick that up. Of course, that's gonna be on bookshop.org. It's on Amazon, it's Barnes and Noble, anywhere that you can find it. We'll post information about that coming up very soon. Um, and we will of course have supplemental events throughout the month um, to enhance what it is that you're learning about the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. And I think that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love having you with us. Thank you, Ben. You rock. Mm, you rock, my friend. Thanks, everybody. I hope to see and hear from many of you next week. And thanks, as always, to Trish for making this happen. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.